Um, we are in Acts chapter 16. We've been in a, a study of Acts. We even got a journal for you and that kind of stuff. Uh, this is week 21. Can you believe that we've been in Acts for 21 weeks? Now, let's see how transparent you'll be. How many of you have never heard of a book preached all the way through in your life and you grew up in church from cover to cover? Okay, all right, awesome. So this is going to be for about a dozen people the first time you've been all the way through a book of the Bible uh, being preached. So uh, I, I'm so glad that Dennis and I have had the opportunity to go through this book because this is all about the launching of the church. Uh, a lot of times when we read the book of Acts, we see it as a, a structure or a model for the church, but that was never intended to be that way. It's actually a model for how to have a relationship with God. Structures change as cultures change, but doctrine never does, the pursuit of God never changes, and our hunger for God never will. Uh, today we're talking about something that uh, for some of us may be a little spooky. Everybody say voices. Everybody say visions. Now, if we're in a leadership conference and we talk about vision and voices, it sounds awesome, but when you talk about it spiritually, for some of us it might get a little creepy. That you hear voices and you see visions. We've got drugs for that, don't we? <laughs> but when we think about a, a, an omniscient, omnipresent God who's everywhere and knows all things, all-powerful, all-knowing God, we must realize that God is spirit. And God speaks to us and He shows us things. And we're going to unpack that a lot. If you've got your Bible, open up to Acts chapter 16. We're going to read verses 6 through 15 and then unpack it. So, um, as you're turning there, just, just remember this week, uh, we need you to step up, get on Realm, sign up for the 4th of July. There's all kinds of things for you to sign up, like outdoor games. If you don't bring outdoor games, we won't have them. Grills, we need a few grills out there, drinks and stuff like that. So if you're coming, make sure you get your ticket for your car. But go on Realm and sign up. Uh, I think we have quite a few spaces opened up. And again, if you can weed eat this week, that whole field's been mowed. But along the railroad tracks, we've got to get some weed eaters because you can't really mow over tracks. Some of you would try it, but it's probably not a good idea. Uh, that's why your wife's not buying you a new lawnmower because you keep trying to mow over stuff. Uh, but we need to weed eat that, so see me in the back right afterwards. Uh, if you can do that, I'm going to try to network you guys together and uh, get that done. So let's get into this. Verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of uh, Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Verse 8. So they passed by Mysia and went down uh, to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing up and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to the sea uh, uh, and sailed straight for uh, Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and, le and the leading city from the district of Macedonia. As we stayed there several days, on the Sabbath, as we stayed there several days, on the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. So they went to church. Everybody say, go to church. So they were looking to gather with the people of God. And it says, we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer. I always thought that was a funny statement in the dealer, because a dealer in purple cloth, people. All right, a dealer uh, in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her house, then when she and her, the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So we see that... Uh, all of a sudden, God speaks to Paul, and a roadblock is put in his missionary journey. And we can see uh, just right out the gate, it gets pretty weird. 
Because most people don't walk around uh, and talk to your fellow co-workers about dreams, visions, and voices. You're not doing that. That's not at the water cooler happening. Not too much, you know, uh, unless it was about what happened Saturday night and you talked about some things that you heard or saw. But let's just go back through this passage and unpack it because I think we need to handle something very, very uh, sensitive and very important in our spiritual walks as believers. Verse 6 says, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and stopped them from going into Asia. Asia. And in verse 7 it says, When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Now I want you to understand something. God is constantly being active. God never stops talking. He never stops communicating. That's what he does. Since the beginning of time, how did God start time? How did God start all creation? He spoke. He said, let there be light. And what happened? Light was formed. Since the beginning of time, God has always been talking. And we have always been trying to listen to voices in our lives. I don't want us to to get to the place where we try to snuff out the voice of God and not hear Him and not obey Him and trust Him. And When we see what happened here in this passage, Paul was going on his missionary journey. He was with Silas. Obviously, Luke is there because we're going to see just how Luke changes from third person to first person. He starts talking about how they were going this way. And you'll see here in this passage, Luke changes and says, So we went. So in response to hearing from God, somehow God is speaking to them in this moment and they're getting ready to go into Asia and they decide that they are not going to go because they want to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Now, what if I told you that being obedient to God was going to add four to five hundred miles by foot to your travels? Everybody in this room, I don't know anybody that gets up and your goal over the next week or so or month is to walk 500 miles. Anybody? anybody? Okay, in fact, we're going to start a, a life group, a 500-mile life group. Anybody want to sign up? <laughs> okay. Uh, we're, I didn't say hiking, Chris. I didn't say hiking. The Holy Spirit just put a wrench in their plans. And added 500 miles to a journey. But here's what needs to happen. You can write this down. When God keeps me from something, He's also keeping me to something. I see so many of us, we'll clean up our lives, but we won't fill them. I see many of us, we stop something, but we don't start something. God will never call you to stop and not start something else. Jesus even told a parable of a man who had a demon in his house. And he kicked the demon out, he cleaned up his house, and he went on a journey. Well, the demon left and he came back with seven more demons. So when the guy came back, he was worse off than he was before. What's the principle there? A lot of us were trying to clean up our lives and empty empty the bad habits and the things that God says, Hey, stop. Don't go there. But then we just stop. We don't fill our lives with anything. That's why I I, I tell people all the time, Christianity is the one religion, it's the only real one, it's the one religion where you don't just empty your mind, you fill your mind. We're filled by the Spirit of God. We just don't empty the bad stuff, we ask God to fill us. We ask God to speak to us. We want to hear God. And we can see that when God keeps us from something, he, He told Paul, He said, don't go into Asia. Now, he tells them to go a different direction and add 500 miles. Do you know we have the book of Philippi because Paul was obedient? And most of you in here know Philippians 4.13 because it's so great for our athletes, apparently. It's the power verse for our athletes. If they have that written on their shoes or on their, you know, painted on their face, then God gives them like superpowers or something. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Paul wrote that while he was in prison in Philippi. Now, what if you knew that? If God says, hey, don't go this direction, go this direction, it's going to lead to your imprisonment. 
I'm going to add 500 miles to your journey. You're going to end up in prison. I mean, I don't, think we, I don't think I realize this sometimes, that when I walk through life, God is not trying to spare me of suffering. God is trying to empower me through it. But most of us, we see a hard road coming, 500 extra miles, and we get, we get to go ahead and we conclude it's not God. I mean, I have a one-year-old at 41 year, year, years old. I mean, most of you are going, yeah, you're not smart. <laughs> well, I want to do what God calls me to do, and that was God's plan for my life. And as hard as that may be at times, it's such a blessing to be in the will of God and do what God calls me to do. I want our church to be a church that's willing to go 500 more miles because God asked us to. I want us to be a people who are willing to do that. Why? Because it changes people's lives when we walk in obedience to what God has. So we've got to learn to listen to the voice of God. John chapter 10 verses 4. This is Jesus saying, When He brought us out, of, uh, 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 brought out all His own, He goes in ahead of them, and His sheep follow Him because they know His voice. Jesus is talking about being the great shepherd to the sheep. And he says they know his voice. Verse 5. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. See, when we hear God, how do we know it's God? Because that's the question that a lot of us ask. How do we know it's God? And we use all these worldly measurements on how to, to tell if it's God speaking to us. Because it seems a little bit weird that God would speak. Well, here's what ends up happening. You don't have to write this down, but it'll be on the screen. It says, we will often follow the voice that we are most familiar with. See, a lot of us, in fact, that's who you follow. You follow what you're familiar with. That's why when you get home, you pour you a drink and you have to have a drink right when you get home. Or right before you go to bed. Or that's why you have to smoke on your break time. That's why the second you get out of a relationship, you look for another one. That's why when you're at home alone, you're looking at things on the internet that you shouldn't be. You run to those things, those voices that you're most familiar with because you've allowed yourself to spend time with them. But see, any voice other than God's will promise something that it can't fully deliver on. Think about all your habits, your hang-ups, your struggles, your addictions, those things, even as believers at times you fall back into. Why do you listen? Why do you follow those voices? It's because you become familiar with them. And also they promise you something. You take things like drinking or, or looking at stuff on the internet or, or, or eating, overeating and stuff like that. People say, well, I, why do I struggle with sin? Because it feels good. Do you know you would not sin if there wasn't any temporary pleasure from it? Sin has a pleasure to it. But guess what? It will always cost you something. What we say around here, every time you sin, something dies. Time, bank account, relationships, dreams, unity, marriages, Influence something dies when you sin. But why do you sin? Why do you keep going back to that? Why do you keep listening to that voice? Because you think maybe, just maybe, the payoff will be real. Or maybe, just maybe, I won't have that negative consequence after I get the pleasure. You've become familiar with the voice that will destroy you. Because that voice is never going to tell you, hey, walk 500 more miles just to say my name just to meet one person named Lydia. Go 500 more miles. That voice is going to say, you've done all that you need to do. You deserve this. After the day that you've had, that voice will tell you, hey, your boss, who could put up with him? Or that, that voice will tell you, yeah, your spouse, all they're trying to do is change you. That voice will tell you, your kids, they just aren't grateful. This generation... Blah, blah, blah. 
They're not like you used to be. You never disrespected your parents. I mean, if you'd really listen to those voices, you immediately know it's not God because they're self-indulgent, they're self-exalting. They promise a short payoff in a short moment and they will never tell you the cost. See, we often follow the voices that we're most familiar with, but any voice other than God's will promise something it can't deliver. We, hey parents, why don't we do this with our children? We know that they're following another voice and we just say things like, well, they're just teenagers. That's what they do. Well, let's just let them get it out of their system and sow their wild oats. You're allowing them to get comfortable with a voice that will kill something in their life. It's not okay. And then we've, we've, we've gotten so used to our children hearing the voice of God through us. You ever been annoyed with people who uh, they answer the phone and they're like, Hey, it's, uh, it's such and such. They want you to know such and such. And they start talking to you through the phone for the other person. I, just, I tell people, just give me the phone. Or if they're trying to do that to me and I say, Hey, uh, you know, they said this. I say, here, y'all talk. I can't stand being the middleman or having the middleman for me. But this is how we've treated God. You need to hand the the cell phone of God to your children and let them learn His voice, not through you. That's why they listen to so many other voices. That's why you listen to so many other voices, because they don't know the voice of God. I always use this as an illustration uh, because I preach a lot and my voice is pretty unique. It's nasally, it's annoying, all kinds of things that are beneficial to your ears. But I was in, uh, we took a staff lunch to Chick-fil-A and... Meredith and Brittany was there. Dustin was on his way. And Meredith and Brittany were standing at the end of the line uh, waiting for their food. And Peyton Roberts was walking by. And I went, Peyton. I didn't say it real loud. And Peyton went like this. And she saw Meredith and Brittany standing there, but she was confused. And then she sees me. She said, oh, I saw Meredith and Brittany, but I heard your voice. She knew my voice. Why? Because I spent a lot of time with the Roberts. They've been in my student ministry for years. My voice is unique. You know your mama's voice, don't you? You know your dad's voice. And you know what that voice means just by them saying your name, whether or not they're upset or they've got something good for you. We understand voices that we spend time with, voices that we listen to, voices that we obey. And many of us have crippled our life because we can't even hear the voice of God because we've let so many other voices in our lives. Culture's voice is so loud for some of us, the, the second a political or a pop culture thing comes along, you will change your life to match that. And you think that that's beneficial. Guess what? Something's dying. But Paul, when he heard the voice of Jesus, and he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit, he knew where to go and where not to go. He stopped, he listened, he changed his direction and everybody with him. And here's the thing, he wasn't confused. Now this is something that I'm still working on in my life, because this is all about spending time with the Lord. You never read where the apostles and the disciples were confused on whether or not God said it. They seemed to have this immediate reaction to a voice coming to them, whether or not it was God or whether or not it was something else. Now, how does that happen? Well, John chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus went on to say this. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them in also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. See, God is, through His voice, bringing people to to Him. He's saying, right now, the first voice that when people hear my voice, the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to bring them to salvation. He said, I've got sheep. I've got people in Wilkes County that still don't know me. But when they hear my voice, they will come into my pen. Now, how do they hear the voice of God? What did God put in place? Everybody say, the church. Do you know Celebration Church exists to be the voice of God? No, I, didn't, I don't mean that you are God, but God uses you. He says, I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell will not prevail. God doesn't have another plan. He doesn't need another plan. Because His voice is strong. People respond to His voice. We just need to be that voice. John 10, 27 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they what? What does it say? They follow me. Now, here's the thing. Some of you are struggling with your salvation, and you should. Because you hear the voice of God and you never follow it. Well, that, ne that needs to be a telling thing. If, if there's a voice stronger in your life than the voice of God and the Word of God, we're going to actually break down voices here in a second. But if there is something stronger, you need to realize that God's voice is the best voice in your life. His plan is to lead you into something amazing for your life. I'm not talking about you getting a, uh, as, as Gabe Duncan would say, an Escalade, because that's his dream car. Cadillac Escalade. That's so 2000s. <laughs> He's not promising you a mansion. He's not promising everything will be rainbows and unicorns. He says, but it'll be worth it if you'll follow me. His voice to you. See, i got to listen to what the Holy Spirit is keeping me from and keeping me to. What's he saying? I got Because you've got to listen to what the Holy Spirit is keeping you from and keeping you to. God never said, walk away from your spouse. If you believe that, it was never God. There's some simple things in your life. If God says, just this one other time, that wasn't God. If you find yourself getting ready to step into something, and, and you line it up with God's Word, and you see it contradicts that, and you feel God is leading you to do it, it is not God. It is not God. God hates divorce. God hates you disobeying your parents. But God loves you into something. He's keeping you to something great. And it's going to take us as a church, of build up of individual parts of the body of Christ, us stepping into hearing and listening to the voice of God. So when I listen to what the Holy Spirit is keeping me from and keeping me to, I have to learn the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you know a voice? How do you know your mama's voice? Somebody tell me. How do you know it's your mama's voice and not somebody else's? How do you know it's your child's voice? Hey, mom, how do you know if it's your, it's your kid crying and not somebody else's kid? How do you know? Because you spent time. You know that voice. You know what it sounds like. And that's how we understand God's voice. It's really simple. This is probably so simple here in the Bible Belt since we, grow up, we grew up in the Bible Belt and we think we know everything and we, we've gone to church our whole lives. But most people don't even know the voice of the Holy Spirit because they don't spend time with Him. I wish I could tell you, hey, read this book and you will hear the voice of God. Well, unless it's this book, you will not. I wish I could tell you, hey, if you spend uh, one Sunday a month with God in church and listen to the Holy Spirit, you will hear His voice all week. No. It's going to be a moment by moment, constant connection, listening to the voice of God. Look at what, listen to what Paul wrote on his way uh, to, to the Roman church. That's where Paul was, we historically think that he was decapitated in Rome. But here's what he says. He says, but when He, the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you. Oh, sorry. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So if you don't hear God's voice, it's real simple. Meet Jesus. Repent of your sin. He'll save you. Now, some of us, we don't, we, we've trusted Christ with our life, but the reason that uh, we don't hear them as because of our disobedience. And our disobedience is a love issue. You haven't spent enough time with God to, to fall in love with Him and let that obedience be the byproduct. Because the Holy Spirit, He speaks. What's He saying right now to you? What's He saying to us as a church? How is He calling us to... to 
do ministry and worship. Jesus said this in John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He will not speak on His own. He will, he will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what is to come. I got a few, uh, a couple pictures I want to go through, and I want us to look at these, and let's just talk about voices that we hear. So pull up that first one that's uh, on voices. So you can see this. We've got all kinds of voices in our lives. You can see a few categories of voices that we have. We got success, accomplishment, fame, wealth. There's a drive and a voice in our life trying to succeed. Is success bad? Absolutely not. But when it's the driving and leading and influential voice in your life, it can destroy you because you're chasing something that at the end of your life, it won't matter. People, do you know that uh, that can be a voice in your life that can be bad? Family and friends. Now, some some of us in this room are saying, yep, I don't listen to my family. That's not what we're talking about. But if that's the driving force in your life and the, the, the uh, force in which you respond to and you obey, you could be in a bad place. Culture, you got social media, you got politics, TV, video games, music. Some of us, we don't think that these things affect us. But I see the culture so much driving the church. This is why we don't see the power of God. What I don't realize is we, we've, we've quit believing the voice of God to change the culture. Do we need to go back to the second chapter of Acts and see what happened? Did the church exist in culture or did it change culture? Well, it changed culture. And it seems like we're just trying to keep our head above water and try not to let culture overtake us. Well, culture, the culture brings darkness, and darkness only exists where light doesn't. And the voice of God is telling us to be light in the darkness, to be hope to the hopeless. So culture can't be the voice, it's the wrong voice. Self. This could be a huge one for some of us, because we're full of so much pride. And we, uh, How many times have you said this? Don't raise your hand if you've said this, because I've said it. I know you have. This is just who I am. You ever made that declarative statement? And somebody says, tell me what type of person you are, or you get in a situation and you start declaring politically who you are and socially who you are. And just like some of us, we don't get over over our phobias because we've decided that's who you are. This is your identity. Well, yourself is a liar. Your identity, it was made in Christ. So your thoughts and feelings and pride. Now, Sometimes our feelings become the strongest voice in our life. That's dangerous, isn't it? Your spouse, when they feel a certain way, does any other voice matter sometimes? Your kids, they feel a certain way. That becomes the strongest voice in the home. Are feelings bad? No, absolutely not. But if they're not directed and influenced by a greater voice, by the voice of the Holy Spirit, then it can lead to things. And then we got Satan and demons. Now some of us, we, we get all in this camp. Everything's a demon. There's a fly that's flying around your head, annoying you, and you go, that's the demon fly. <laughs> and then some of us, the second we say Satan and demons, you're like, I, nah, I don't, it's, not, it's circumstances. Well, guess what? There is a spiritual realm that we cannot see because we've been blinded because of our sin, but one day our eyes will be open fully to that. There are voices in your life and influences in your life that are demonic. Why? Because Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to neutralize the church. He does not want you to care about our community or our neighborhood, and he will often use yourself to tell you to do that. Well, uh, there's that, all they do is talk about inviting people and bringing people to Jesus. Why? I'm just trying to get my own life right. Well, guess what? Bring people along on your messy journey. You know what a big tragedy would be with God blessing us with the opportunity to have that railroad, that whole place there at the CBD loop uh, to do the 4th of July is if we don't bring any of the community with us. Now, this is a family event, and we're talking about this is a celebration family, but I want a bunch of people there to see how awesome of a family this is. And I hope you're a good family member. I hope you're good at contributing to the family. But those voices, voices cannot be the foundation of our life 
But let's look at this next one. If we hear voices in our life, then the foundation of that voice, here's how you judge the voices in your life. Here's how you weed out what is not God and what is, is you keep the Word of God as the foundation. If you hear something from people and it does not line up with the Word of God, guess what? It's not God. Because guess what God will use? God will use people. Because God's speaking. What else will God use? God will use visions. Now, for a lot of people in this room, that's like way out there kooky. Well, right there, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia begging, please come and help us. Now, sometimes, you ever uh, had dreams and visions? How many of you dream a lot? Raise your hand. That doesn't mean, guess what? Every dream you have isn't from God. Sometimes it's bad pizza. Really, that studies have shown that sometimes indigestion can make you dream weird things. Well, how do you know it's from God? How do you know if a dream is from God? Well, does it line up with the Word of God? That is your litmus test. Well, how do you know if it lines up with the Word of God? Because you're memorizing it and you're studying it. If you're not reading your Bible, then don't, don't expect to hear the voice of God because He's given us this. Over 1,500 years, over three continents, over 40 authors, 66 books, and it's seamless from cover to cover, and he's done that so you can quickly hear his voice. Because right when Paul heard the Holy Spirit speak to him, he turned and he went to Philippi, 500 miles out of the way. Well, the Word of God also comes through circumstances. Now, this isn't karma, by the way. If you're a Christian, quit saying it's karma. Karma is actually demonic. But God will use circumstances. He will put things in your path to steer you different ways by His grace for His glory. But how do you know it's God? Because some people say, well, I'll just keep going until the door closes. Are you kidding me? Where do you find that in the Bible? It's a great idea. Well, you don't... It's not all about closed doors or open doors. It's about hearing God whether or not you walk through the open door or you close the open door. And God does want you to know. But guess what? If you open the wrong door and go through the wrong door, the universe is not going to unravel. God is sovereign. So some of us were thinking about this. Oh gosh, i got to hear the voice of God so good. If I mess up, then we're going to cause like time lapses in the world and then the universe is going to spin out. No, (laughs) no. God's got you. He already knows that you're going to screw up. Now, that doesn't justify your sin. Well, God knew I was going to sin, so I might as well do it. No, absolutely not. God is supposed to lead and guide and direct you. That's why the Bible says, walk in step with the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit. He will guide you into all truth. Sometimes we have dreams, and sometimes you just hear a voice. Voices. Let's see. How many of you have heard voices before? Now, how many of you have lied before? Okay, that, that's actually the answer to the first question, too. Everybody, you hear voices all the time, and you've got to find a way to filter out the right voices, and that has have to be rooted in the Word of God. Now, you say, Brian, are you saying that God has to speak in an audible voice? Does He speak in an audible voice? Yes, He can, and sometimes He does. But his main form of communication is way more powerful. Think about this, especially you parents. If you had to speak audibly to your children or you could speak straight to their spirit, which one would you choose, especially in public? I mean, your kids would be like, okay, sorry. So God can speak audible, but he doesn't have to lower himself to our standards. But we have to have spiritual ears. So God speaks in a more powerful way, but a a way that we have to be disciplined in knowing His Word and knowing His voice. And most of you, if God spoke to you audibly, like when Jesus was being baptized, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. If God spoke audibly into your life, you would probably have an immediate heart attack and fall over dead. But God is constantly talking. Are you hearing Him? And are you listening to him? Acts 16, 
verses 8. It says, So they went, they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia begging him, Come over here to help us. Write this down. God will reveal what I need to see when I get into the place to see it. God is speaking and He's telling you to get somewhere. And a lot of us, our bank account, our uh, 401k plan, our school plan, our, we've got all these steps laid in place and we've got all these plans which are good. Some of you, yeah, I don't, I don't plan anything. I just try to follow the Holy Spirit. No, you need to ask God what the plan is. Because uh, two or three times in Proverbs it says, Man may plan his ways, but God directs his path. Affirming that you should have a plan. If you know the Holy Spirit and if you trust Jesus Christ with your life, get a plan, make a plan, but be willing to follow the Holy Spirit. in. Because Paul had a plan. Where were they going? They were going to Asia. They had a whole team. They had a whole plan. And then right when they heard the Holy Spirit, they, they made a different direction. And Paul had this vision. Now, what was this vision? It was a vision. Literally, while he was awake, while he was standing there, he sees a man come before him. You say, Brian, does people have, do we have visions today? Oh, absolutely. God does not. God can speak any way that he wants. I've had one vision for sure in my life and try to discern some other things. But the one vision I know was early on in ministry, God showed that I would get to see... And be a part of a church that was reaching thousands of people. And the people were so hungry and so on board with God's vision that the sacrifice that they made would just bring joy to the community. How do I know that's the voice of God? Because I've read all throughout Acts over and over again. And I can see that's exactly what God has done. Well, Brian, that's easy to have a vision like that. Okay, well, it's messed me up that I can't not see it through. It's the one thing that I keep getting back to. And I ask God, uh, I've asked God this. God, why in the world did you show me that and I have not seen it yet? Why don't you bring that to pass? And he, said, and he says this to me all the time. He said, Brian, are you still willing to serve me as though you see it, even if you don't see it in your lifetime? Because that's the heart God wants. The heart, the, the heart God wants is not that we become a church and all of a sudden we reach people, but we will do anything to reach people even if it doesn't happen in our generation. Because one, now, we, I hope we do see it. I want to see thousands come to Christ. But I want to serve Him as though thousands are coming to Christ right now. Are you willing? Are you pressing in that much? There's teenagers in the room, students in the room that you're so far disconnected from God because you believe at 15 you're smarter than your parents. Guess what? They thought the same thing. But there's, let me tell you why Satan comes up against our young people so much because nobody expects them to be on fire for God. I've seen that over and over in my life is when students wake up to the call of God in their life, it blows adults away because we're so apathetic often in our faith. We're good moral adults. But when they get aggressive for the gospel and start doing many things for God and they start hearing God and seeing God and following God, it puts us to shame. So teenagers in this room, wake up. God wants to put a fire in your heart. He wants you to do amazing things. The culture expects nothing of you except for you to consume everything. Consume media, consume video games, consume pop culture, consume the music, consume, consume, and contribute nothing. And God says, I've made you a light in the darkness. I put a fire in your heart. I made you a, a, a drop in the flood of my spirit. So wake up. Do something huge. Nobody expects it, but the spirit of God is calling you. God will reveal what I Need to see when I get up and get into a place to see it. So it's real simple. Get where God is leading me. Everybody say immediately. Hey, man, right now, you need to do something about your home because God has already called you. 
but you've been disobedient because you've screwed up with your wife or you've messed up with your kids. You're not Jesus. You are going to mess up. But you've got to step into faith and believe that the Holy Spirit is leading you. He is speaking to you on what to do with your family and how to lead in a godly way. And He's going to empower you to do it. That's what I love about the Holy Spirit's leading. He will never call you to something that He won't empower you to do for His glory. Acts 16 verse 10, it says, After Paul had seen the vision, we got up. Here's where the language changed. Luke is writing the book of Acts. And this is the first time Luke alludes to him being there. He says, We got ready at once to leave from Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. See, there was a conclusion. When God spoke, they knew the gospel was to be preached. So write this down. Anytime where God is leading means my gospel preaching. God's leading in your life means gospel preaching. God's leading means that when you, he, you, he puts you in your workplace or in your school or at that family get-together, when God led you there, what's His intention? That those people hear about Christ and that they're, they're set free. We're so afraid of Jesus. We've turned into, hey, there's places... I, I asked a Colton Miller this the other day. We were in Life on Life. I said, when is a good time to share Jesus? And he said, any time. I said, where's a good place to share Jesus? Everywhere. So anywhere and everywhere, that's where the gospel should be preached. God's leading means my gospel preaching. Now, you might say, I'm not a preacher. Well, if you know anything about the Word of God, it says the Holy Spirit will give you the words when you need it. You are a preacher and you're called to preach. Preacher is not an occupation in a Bible. It's a calling to the people of God. There's pastors and teachers, but preachers are everybody. Acts 16 verse 13 says, On the Sabbath they went outside to the city gate to a river, to the river, where we expected... They had an expectation to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman, uh, to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Do you know that when you get to the place that God has spoke to you about? He's already done the work. Um, I didn't know it, but uh, about f- three weeks ago, uh, I've been working for years, uh, about two years now, at the, the gym that I work out at sometimes. Don't want to make it sound like I work out there every day. Obviously, I don't. Uh, but I've been building these relationships, but I can only attribute it to... Satan's work, but he's pretty much scattered about 16 guys. Pretty much work out with Colton and a few others uh, from time to time, but that big, huge group that God just allowed me to start ministering to. Well, what I didn't know was about four weeks ago, one of those guys snuck in here and I was sitting over here and got to hear the gospel and said, man, I can't believe. I love your church. See, right when you think that the work of God isn't working you see the work of God working when you keep at it keep sharing the gospel you can't save anybody the pressure's not on you we can't grow this church only God can but we can go where we need to go because we've listened to the voice of God say what we need to say because we're obeying the voice of God and he's going to do what he's going to do He's calling you to invite people to a community. That's your community. By the way, if you're not willing to say, this is my church, and you take responsibility for it, why are you in a church? This is your church. You are our family. Now, teenagers, we might do that at a family gathering and be like, I don't know them. (laughs) But we're just joking around. Guess what? Your family, you're accountable to me, I'm accountable to you. And we got to speak up and be that voice. We got to hear the voice of God, shut out the other voices, and know the voice. I would love to hear about this week 500 mile detours in your life because you finally listened. 
and you put down the habit that's killing your life, you go back to your spouse, you repent to your parents and to God. I would love to hear about that because when we start hearing about that, then people step up. We have no excuse. But right now the church has so many excuses to not reach the people. I mean, think about that, Paul. We were reading about a man who had a vision. We start talking like that, people are going to think we're crazy. But when, you're so, when you know the voice of God so well that you're willing to say that you heard Him speak or you saw Him show you something, how are people going to argue with that? Well, they might argue, but then they'll see your life and they'll know it's so much different. that you, They'll go, you know what, I want what they have. And people will be set free. So we got to get to the place where we expect God to move when I follow His voice. You can bank on it. Because He's not a liar. God is not unfaithful. And we need to expect God to move when I follow His voice. God has called me to preach the Word of God. When I get up here, I expect Him to do something in my life and in yours. I expect it. I expect someone to get saved today. I expect it. Why? Because he said that he wishes none but perish, but all come to repentance. I expect people to be set free from addictions, habits, and hang-ups. Why? Because who the Son sets free is free. I expect us to be so fired up when we gather here on a Sunday that we go out and we change the community. Why? Because he said, you will be my witnesses and you will receive power. Do you feel like the church, answer out loud, does the church in Wilkes County look like she has power? Does she look like it? No. Is God a liar? No. Why? Because He spoke and He can't lie. Otherwise, He's not God. So guess what? Celebration Church, you have power. Because He said so. So you expect power in your life. You expect your family to come to repentance. You expect your kids to come back because you're on your face praying for them as the Spirit of God is speaking to you and leading you. I'm so excited about what God is doing. I want us to obey Him out of our love for Him and expect Him to do something. So right there where you wrote your next step, just whatever He's speaking to you right now, what should you be expecting? Is it the, to break off a habit? Is it the salvation of somebody in your family? Is it to finally invite somebody to sit beside you in church? What is it? Last week, I talked about uh, discipleship and life on life, and I think we got like back two connection cards saying that people wanted to be in life on life discipleship. Now, here's my assessment of that. That's fine. Maybe you're not supposed to be in life on life discipleship, but you, th- maybe this is where you listen. God has called you to be discipled by someone and for you to disciple someone. So maybe we need to just go back and you finally listen to that. Because people say, well, I don't hear the voice of God since I gave my life to Christ. I said, well, what's the last thing that he told you? Some people say, well... He called me to be baptized because that's the first step of obedience. But now, uh, I, just, I just felt like as an adult that that would have been weird. And I, I love Jesus and I was sprinkled as a kid or baptized as a kid. But I came to faith later in life. Well, don't expect to hear God if you're not going to obey the first thing that He told you. So if you're not hearing the voice of God, a few things. Maybe you just haven't spent time with Him to hear His voice. Or you haven't listened to the last thing that He said. Now, if only two other people want to go through life-on-life discipleship, that's fine. But this church, if you are a believer, you should be discipled and you should be discipling someone. And God led us to that, to be preached and for us to do that as a body. So if you're not willing to do that, I I think it's you doing this. You ever had a kid do this? La, 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 la. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Would you please hush? Stop. He loves us. And he's, not, he's, he's calling us to be different. He's calling us to hear His voice and be empowered by it. So whatever your next step of expectation, you got to step in and listen to Him. 
here in just a couple minutes, we're getting ready to take communion. Do you know that when we come to this communion table, this is our commission. This is us actually saying, I'm willing to be obedient to you. We're going to sing here in just a moment. It's going to be a time of reflection because Paul tells us, don't come to these tables. Don't come and take communion with unforgiveness in your heart, disobedience in your heart. And some people won't take communion because they, they've got unforgiveness. Look, you can deal with that right now. In this moment, you can forgive your dad. In this moment, you can give up that addiction that you've put on as an idol in place of God. And you can come to these tables here in just a few minutes. And you can be obedient and be with the family and be expected of God moving. Because coming to this table is you saying, hey, I want to hear. I want to know. Because his body was broken. His blood was shed. I want to hear him. And out of hearing him, I want to listen. Because there's a difference. Because we've said it to our kids. I know you hear me, but I need you to listen to me. And I think the church hears God just fine. Just we don't listen. Because we've allowed sin to block us. So let's just spend the next few minutes. I'm going to pray. And let's just spend it repenting. Either repenting for salvation for some of us. You've never trusted Christ. Repent means change of mind and direction. And we need to repent for salvation. And you can come talk to me. I'll be right over here and say, I want to receive Jesus. And you need to do that in obedience to Him. But for the rest of us, you need to repent for restoration. You need to say, God, I hear you, but I'm going to listen. And I change, I turn. I'm walking in obedience. I know it's a 500-mile detour, but today's the day. And I come to these tables expecting. So whenever you're ready during this, as we sing, I want you to come, get the, the, the bread, get the communion, uh, the, the juice, and just go back to your seat because we're going to take as a family. But don't come here till you allow God to deal with some things in your heart. So let's stand to our feet.